Howdy, our names are Lucy Wilson, Alex Robert, and Kendra Ho Ching, and we will be performing for you, We, we Wept and moved, moved West. The forced evacuation of the Cherokee Indians in 1838, known as the Trail of Tears, abused the Indians' rights, depriving them of ancestral lands due to the economic desires of white settlers and self-serving government officials under the leadership of Andrew Jackson. President Andrew Jackson's refusal to take responsibility for upholding the Supreme Court's decision in the Worcester versus Georgia case was a major factor in the loss of Native American rights. The coming of the white immigrants in the 1700s changed the lives of the Cherokee Indians forever, known as one of the five civilized tribes because they had a written language. They adapted to the white men's ways. One white missionary wrote, Thus far are the Cherokee advanced, farther I believe than any other nation or tribe in America. Ken Burns and Stephen Ives wrote, No Eastern tribe had struggled harder or more successfully to make white civilization their own. But after gold was discovered on their land, they were told they would have to start over again in the West. From this time on, Europeans would forever be an influence on the actions and decisions made by the Cherokee. I've heard that Lannan Zalonaga and the rest of Georgia is rich in treasures and wealth. Eureka! I've struck gold! Oh, thank you, Lord, thank you! Them engines have no need for this valuable metal. They don't got no use for gold. But we can build civilized towns and sturdy homes. Oh, I have been waiting for this day my whole hard life. And finally it's come in 1828. Hey, 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 have you heard of the beautiful fortune that's waiting for us? A man found gold in Delonica, Georgia. Yeehaw. A land that engines are living on. A whole lot of settlers and miners have been talking about it. Why? It's all over town. If I could just get my hands on that gold. All I want in this creation is a pretty little wife and a big plantation way down yonder on the Cherokee Nation. The engines are passing down our valuable land. I say we run them off and take what we deserve. Amen. It is a little surprising that when we enter treaties with our brothers the whites, the whole cry is for more land. Corn Tassel has spoken. Corn tassel, corn tassel, they come. The white skinned men come with their fire and metal weapons. They invade our homes and destroy our possessions. They're trying to drive us off our homelands. They cannot do this to us. This is our land given by the great spirits. Besides the many invaders that were intruding on the Cherokee lands in search of gold, the state of Georgia was making laws that concerned the Cherokee nation. The Cherokee opposed Georgia's rule over them, and in 1831, in Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, the Supreme Court declared that according to the Constitution, they had no jurisdiction over this case, being that the Cherokee were a domestic, dependent nation whose relation to the United States resembles that of a ward to his guardian. Good day, young Cherokee. I am the young minister from Vermont, Samuel Worcester. I've come to educate you of this holy book and to translate its teachings to your native language. You are appreciated, but you not stay. Government of Georgia not allow a white man here with no agreement papers. You will be punished. Do not be concerned. I do not fear the law. The law of the state of Georgia alienates all white persons from residing within the boundaries of the Cherokee Territory without a license or permit from His Excellency, the Governor. You are under arrest for violating the state law and entering Cherokee Territory without a license. My instincts were correct. According to these treaties between the Cherokee Nation and the Government of the United States, the Cherokee are an independent nation. I have lived with the Cherokee. They are just as civilized as any white settler in Georgia. Georgia has no right to make laws governing the Cherokee Nation. I'm taking this to the Supreme Court. Oh Lord, let me win this case. The court would be ruling unconstitutional if they do not declare Cherokee's independence from Georgia. It is the opinion of this court that the act of the legislature of the state of Georgia is contrary to the Constitution, treaties, and laws made by the United States. 
We rule that Indian tribes are distinct, independent political communities retaining their original natural rights. My brother, you hear news from white man's courts? We win our rights back. Indeed, Georgia can make no more demands. The clouds have parted. Now it was up to the President of the United States to enforce the Supreme Court's decision. As President Andrew Jackson, my office leaves me in no condition to deal with such an issue concerning the Indians. And if anyone were to bind me to such a duty as to enforce the Supreme Court's decision, it would be my political enemy, Chief Justice John Marshall. No, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. The President refuses to obey court's ruling for our freedom and protection, and our friend Worcester is still behind the iron bars. Yes, the Tsar has laid a shadow over my heart. By refusing new decision of Supreme Court, the President allows the first decision, decision the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia decision, to stand like the Great Mountain. President Jackson, speaking to Congress, said, I suggest for your consideration the priority of setting apart an ample district west of the Mississippi to be guaranteed to Indian tribes as long as they shall occupy it. The Cherokee strongly disagreed and feared the possibility of their removal. It has been the desire of enemies that the Cherokee be urged to some desperate act. Thus far, this desire has never been realized and we hope this forbearance will continue. We wish to remain on the land of our fathers. We have a perfect and original right to remain without interruption. If we are compelled to leave our country, we see nothing but ruin before us. At the expense of the United States to send the Indians where their existence may be prolonged and perhaps made perpetual. Still, it is not the land of our birth, nor our affections. It contains neither the scenes of our childhood, nor the graves of our fathers. President Andrew Jackson and the Cherokee people had two different outlooks on the removal and welfare of the Cherokee. A group of unauthorized Cherokees signed a treaty not representing the entire Cherokee population that agreed to the Indians' removal in exchange for money hoping it would reduce violence. However, it led to General Winfield Scott leading an army greatly outnumbering the Cherokee. They marched onto the Indian tribal land and tore the Cherokee families from their homes before stealing all of their possessions. They greatly abused the rights of these people. A Baptist minister named Evan Jones sadly observed, The Cherokees are nearly all prisoners. They have been dragged from the homes and encamped at the forts and military places all over the nation. Multitudes are allowed no time to take anything with them except the clothes had on. Females are driven on foot before bayonets of brutal men. It is the work of war and time of peace. I am an infantryman ashamed to say that I did participate in the invasion of the Cherokee territory. I later fought in the war between the states and saw many men shot to pieces by the thousands. But the removal of the Cherokee was the cruelest work I ever knew. During the winter of 1838 to 1839, the United States forced between 13 to 17,000 Cherokee Indians to Oklahoma on that long, dangerous journey. Long time you travel on way to new land. People feel bad when they leave own nation. Women's cries and make sad wails. Children cry and many men cry. And all look sad when friend die, but say nothing and just put heads down and keep on going towards west. Many days pass and people die. We very close by trail. Hundreds of Cherokee died. More hundreds were physically and emotionally wounded as they struggled with nothing to survive that hard journey. And all of them suffered. This suffering could possibly have been prevented if President Jackson upheld his responsibility. The survivors of the Trail of Tears finally arrived in Oklahoma. They slowly rebuilt their lives under European influence, but still couldn't live in peace. They later lost part of their land after fighting with the South in the Civil War. In many instances, following more of their land was lost. For example, in 1905, the Indian Territory became a state, and therefore was no longer Cherokee's land, but was owned by another nation. 
President Jackson's promise that, that as long as the grass shall grow and the stream shall run, the Indians would be able to dwell in Oklahoma, free of the white society, was never fulfilled because that land now belonged to the United States. Because so many white men were in favor of the Indian Removal Act, the removal of the Cherokee was perhaps inevitable. However, this early persecution of the Indians and their land has caused unfavorable relationships between the Cherokee and the federal government and unsuitable living conditions for these people even today. Many struggle to make a living while at the same time preserve their unique culture. As George Satsiana stated, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And we must never repeat the abuse of any individual's rights. And it is the responsibility of every citizen as well as our government leaders to vigorously protect the rights for all.